In this video, I'll talk about residual analysis for multiple linear regression. So we'll use the, the trucking example again. We've got predictor x1 and x2. x1 is the number of miles traveled, x2 is the number of deliveries, and the response variable is the time taken. And we fit our model and we got our estimates. And so now, before we use the model for prediction or inference, we need to do some residual analysis to have some reassurance that the uh, assumptions underlying the model are reasonable. And so, again, the assumptions relate to the model errors, and there's four of them, zero mean, constant variance, independence, and normality. And we're gonna assess those assumptions using residuals. And just to remind you what a residual is, it's the difference between y, the observed y, and y hat, which is the predicted y. And the predicted y is just coming from the model equation using the predictor values. And then the residual, so for example here, it's 9.3 minus 8.9385 and so on. So we can calculate a residual for every observation. And then we can create a residual scatter plot that has the residuals on the vertical axis, the predicted values y hat on the horizontal axis, and we can assess the zero mean and the constant variance assumptions. So we talked about this when we were thinking about simple linear regression and it's kind of the same process with multiple linear regression. What we're looking for here is any kind of pattern in the residuals that would cause us to doubt either one of those assumptions. If it looks just like a horizontal band of points, which it does in this case, given the small sample size, then there's nothing to worry about. If we had a very strong nonlinear pattern, we might be concerned about the zero mean assumption. If we had a very strong, say, funnel shape to the residuals, we might doubt the constant variance assumption. But in this case, there's no real strong patterns to worry about. So it looks like the zero mean and the constant variance assumptions are, are, are reasonable. Uh, the independence assumption, that usually has most relevance in time series applications, which is not what we have here. And so we're gonna just for simplicity assume that it, independence holds. And then the normality assumption, we're gonna use the standardized residuals for the normality assumption and create a normal probability plot, also known as a QQ plot. That's what this is here. It's hard to create that from scratch and so we're going to rely on software to create this for us and the idea is if the points lie roughly along a 45 degree line then we've got no reason to doubt the normality assumption and that's the case here the points are close enough to that 45 degree line that normality is is reasonable okay so that's residual analysis for the uh, checking the assumptions we can also think about residuals as helping us identify potentially influential points. And so just as with simple linear regression, there's two ways that a point could be potentially influential. One is if its Y value is a long way from its Y hat value. So it's observed Y is a long way from its predicted Y. Then such a point is called an outlier and it may be having a big influence on the model. So we would want to investigate that point and perhaps do the analysis twice, both with and without that point and see if there's a big change in the results. So we can identify outliers by looking at the standardized residuals and seeing if any of them are less than minus two or larger than plus two. And remember the standardized residuals depend on the leverages and on the 
regular residual and on the standard error of the estimate. The residuals, sorry, the leverages, those are quite difficult to calculate. So, um, and unfortunately, Excel stat, I cannot find a way for Excel stat to give us the leverages. So I've done a little bit of side work in a, another worksheet to calculate the leverages. So this is definitely kind of going above and beyond uh, here to calculate these because we're using matrix algebra here. So what I've done here is, I'll just go through this quickly, just in case you're interested. Uh, this is called the X matrix, what I've highlighted here. It consists of a column of ones. These numbers are x, x, the x1 variable and these numbers are the x2 variable. So put them all together into a 10 by three matrix and this is called the x matrix, the model matrix. Here I've got the transpose of that matrix. Okay, so see I've got a row of ones and these numbers are the 10 x1 values and these numbers are the 10 x2 values. So I've got a 10 by three matrix here and a three by 10 matrix here. So I can multiply this matrix by this matrix. So that's what I've done here. So this is the X matrix multiplied by the transpose of the X matrix. Now I've got a square three by three matrix and I can invert that. So that's what this is. It's the inverse of this matrix. Okay, now I can take this matrix and I can multiply it by this matrix, okay? Because this, no, by this matrix, <laughs> I wanna get this right. Okay, this is 10 by three and this is three by three, so I can, I can multiply those two matrices together and get a 10 by three matrix. And then I can multiply this matrix, 10 by three, by this matrix, which is three by 10. And then I get this giant matrix, which is 10 by 10. Okay, and then I can look at the diagonal, this diagonal of this matrix, and this is called the H matrix or the hat matrix. It's called the hat matrix because it puts the hat on Y. So the H matrix, okay. And the diagonal of that matrix consists of the leverages. Okay, 0 0.3517, 0 0.3759, 3517, 3759, that's what these numbers are, are the leverages. So it's a fair bit of work to get the leverages, but uh, as I say, Excel stat won't give them to me, so I had to calculate them by scratch. Okay, our threshold for leverage is three times P plus one, P is the number of predictors, N divided by N, N is the sample size. So it comes to 0 0.9 for this example. So the way we use leverages is see if any are bigger than 0 0.9. If they are, they're flagged as a high leverage point and we might want to investigate further by removing the data point from the data set, refitting, seeing what happens to the model. If it doesn't have a huge effect, just leave the point in. If it does have a future, huge effect, see why. What is, it, what is up with that point that's, that's causing the model results to differ so greatly? Uh, in this case, we don't have anything to worry about. Nothing's bigger than 0.9. Okay, so we started the whole discussion because we were thinking about standardized residuals and the standardized residuals are used in the, in the uh, normal probability plot. There's also another way of standardizing, which is called studentizing. And this has this formula here. And the idea behind studentized residuals is if, if we did have a residual that was really outlying. So let, let's suppose in this list of standardized residuals, we had one that was, I don't know, 10. Then 
it's going to have an effect on the whole model. And in particular, it's going to inflate this number here, this standard error of the estimate. And uh, this number is used in the calculation of the standardized residuals. So the calculation of the standardized residuals is affected by whether this, whether there's an outlier in here. Okay, so it's kind of a circular argument here. So what we can do is we can actually calculate a studentized residual, which is like a residual based on a model fit to all the other observations. So excluding the one you're doing the residual for. And that way you, you won't have that problem I just talked about. If there was like a really big outlier that was inflating this number. Okay, it gets around that problem. Uh, turns out that there's a way of calculating these studentized residuals without having to fit 10 different models, which is nice. So that's what these numbers are here, studentized residuals. And sometimes studentized residuals are used to identify outliers rather than just the regular standardized residuals. Okay, so, so outliers and high leverage points, they tell you kind of the potential for influence, okay? If, if a point is flagged because it's high leverage or a point is flagged because it might be an outlier, we want to investigate it. Uh, and it may or may not be influential. So there's another measurement of influence called Cook's distance. And that is kind of a composite me measurement that combines leverage and residuals into a single number. And the criteria here is super easy is you calculate the Cook's distances and then you look and see if any of them are bigger than one. Okay, uh, let's see, this is the biggest one, but it's not bigger than one. So more than likely there's no influential points in this data set. We might wanna look at this one anyway, because it's, it's the largest value of Cook's distance. So if we were being really thorough, we might see what happens to the model if we omit this particular observation. Uh, but chances are because this Cook's distance is not bigger than one, it's not gonna have a huge effect. Okay, so let's, uh, let's use Excel stat to do what we can with uh, residual analysis. As I say, it doesn't do everything. It won't do leverages, it won't do Cook's distances, but it'll pretty much do everything else. Okay, so we'll fit the model and take a look at what we have. Okay, so let's just make it a little bigger so we can see what's going on. We'll scroll down. Okay, and then these are the residual plots and the one we want to look at is this one here. Okay, so standardized residuals on the vertical axis, y hat on the predicted y, or y hat on the, on the horizontal axis, and then we use this to assess the zero mean and the constant variance assumptions. Okay, uh, and then we can look at these guys, so Excel stat labels these as studentized residuals, but this is actually what we've been calling standardized residuals. So 0.783 minus 0.35. It's these ones here. And we can get a QQ plot or a normal probability plot by going to describing data and then normality tests. And Let's find the right data range. It was these ones. And then we'll okay. And it'll do a whole bunch of, of numerical tests, but what we're really interested in is the, the normal probability plot or what it calls the QQ plot. 
So let's just scroll down and find that. So that's this one here. Okay, so this one will help us assess the normality assumption. Okay, so that's a residual analysis for multiple linear regression.